Oh, you bought which share right now? RBL. RBL? You did a proper analysis? Yes. Uh, what is the full form of RBL? It's Royal Bank of London. Hey folks, CA Rachna Ranade here and I welcome you all to a very important and informative video not about Royal Bank of London but about Ratnakar Bank Limited. Subsequently, the name was also changed. A lot of information coming up in the immediate next part of the video. Uh, by the way, if you want, for a change, you can first like the video and then watch the entire video. Let's understand a little bit about the history of RBL Bank. RBL Bank was formerly known as Ratnakar Bank and it, it is an Indian private sector bank which has its headquarter in Mumbai. It was started on August 6th, 1943 and its focus point was only on these two regions which is Kolhapur and Sangli. The focus point was mainly to give loans to the SME businesses and SME merchants is what I can say. In 1970, they received a banking license from RBI. Then comes the entry of Mr. Vishwavir Ahuja in July 2010, wherein he became the MD, MD and CEO of the bank. Well, he is a person who has a rich banking experience of 27 years and before joining RBL, he was with Bank of America. Going forward to August 2014, the name of Ratnakar Bank was changed to RBL. Now starts the amazing point of RBL. After the appointment of Mr. Ahuja, how the bank dramatically or drastically changed is what we are going to discuss in the immediate next part of the video. Salatarma ata ghevya Ratnakar Banke cha dashka til pragati cha adhava. Rachana English. Sorry. So let's decode the performance of the entire decade of Ratnakar Bank. Now, why I'm saying Ratnakar Bank? Because if you remember earlier, the name was Ratnakar Bank and eventually in 2014, it was changed to RBL Limited, right? So what essentially we are going to do in this part of the video is we are going to compare before Mr. Rahuja's entry, what happened? Because he came into picture in 2010, right? So before Mr. Rahuja's entry and after Mr. Rahuja's entry. So we are going to compare 2001 to 2010 to 2010 to 2020. Clear? Now let's start with the performance decade decoding. Uh, right, so for, we are going to talk about three major parameters. Which three parameters? First, we are going to talk about number of employees. Number of employees grew from 536 in 2012 to 907 in 2010-11. So I can say roughly the number of employees doubled in the entire decade. But this is now after Mr. Hauja's entry, what happened? Number of employees from 907 went up to 9,257. So this is almost a 10 times jump. Okay, so this is not exactly a decade because we are going to compare 2011 to 2022, latest data. Okay, okay. Going back to the next one, that is advances, loans and advances before. In the prior decade, it went up from two, uh, 270 crores to 1,905 crores. Okay, now let's compare this jump to 2011 to 2022 data wherein the advances jumped from 1905 crores to 60022 crores so this is like a 30 times jump in the loans and advances book going ahead with the last data point which is about deposits the deposits grew from 604 crores to 2042 crores in the prior decade and then in the next decade it grew from 2042 crores to 79070 crores so this is like almost a 40 times jump oh my god so i hope this is very clearly visible about how the growth was before mr rahuja's entry and after his entry right now was it only us who felt that he is doing a great job for the bank so i believe if you have a look at this data you will understand that how everyone in the industry was of the opinion that yes he is doing a fantastic job just have a look at the awards and accreditations this is only data points from 2012 to 2016 in these years just to give you an example the bank was awarded with the best indian banker small size bank they also got best bank private sector lending bank uh, they also got an award for the fastest growing small bank. They got an award for best overall bank in the small category. They also got an innovation award which was for their debit card program by MasterCard. So I was just giving you some examples out of all the awards and uh, accreditations. So I hope you have understood how key, what, what a key role has this person played in RBL Bank. Now even if I talk about this same period, the second half of the decade, 
one more important point happened in 2016 and that was the IPO of RBL right IPO was priced at 224 to 225 and at the time of IPO almost 66 percent of their employees were covered under the ESOP now you can imagine this is a very big number right 66 percent of the employees having I mean being covered under the ESOP this IPO was listed on the bourses at 274 rupees per share and it saw a high of 716 rupees per share in May 2019. And if you know today, the price of the share is barely 83 rupees. I'm sure a question has come up in your mind that in spite of all these things going at a great pace, exactly what went wrong, Mashi Kutha Shinkli? That's what we are going to discuss in the next part of the video. Now let's try and understand the very first key pain point for the bank. The very first one is that it has a high exposure to unsecured and high risk category lending. Of course, if I'm saying high exposure, high exposure as compared to its peers. See, whenever I'm talking about any pain points of the company, you must be aware that from where I have taken the data, major data has been extracted from annual reports and the investor presentations. So if you want to have the data with you, you can take screenshots immediately. This is the first one done second and third now with this data points with you just focus on how it all happened from 2018 to current year 2022 the very first one is credit card accounts credit card as so credit card lending as a percentage of total lending of the bank o originally in 2018 it was just at 5.57 percent it increased to 22.29 if I'm talking about microfinance lending as a percentage of total lending, in FY18, it was at 8.84% and subsequently it increased to 12.2% in financial year 21. Of course, it cooled off a little bit in FY22 to 8.08%. If I'm talking about credit card and MFI, they are currently in the top 10 and top 5 in the industry and this tells us about the exposure that they have in these two areas. Even if I'm going to small business loan accounts, out of the total exposure, 18.4% of the total loans is only to small business loans. So all in all, if I were to take up all these three categories together, almost 43% of their total loan book goes to only credit cards, microfinance and small business loan and that is the reason why I'm saying that this is like a pain point wherein they have an exposure, high exposure to either unsecured or a high risk category. Then which kind of a loan would come into a low risk category? Of course it would be a home loan as an example, right? Now let's understand how much exposure do they have in the home loan as compared to the total loans. In FY21, it was only 2.8% and in FY22, it increased to 4.1%. So I hope you have understood how lopsided it is, right? When management was asked about this, that how much time would you take to shift from this unsecured or high risk category to comparatively a secured lending book, management has mentioned that they would need around three years for this turnaround. Now let's move on with the second pain point. See in the first pain point we said that they gave a lot of loans which were in the high risk or in the unsecured category. Giving loan is not a problem. Problem is when they are not able to recover that loan, right? Now we have to understand how was the recoverability in the pre-pandemic situation and in the post-pandemic situation. So what are we going to do? We are going to compare 2018-19 with 2021 and 22, we are not going to consider 2020 in the analysis why it was an abnormal year, right? With this understanding, let's start with 2018-19 as far as gross NPA is concerned. Gross NPA was at 1.4% and 1.38% respectively and look at 2021 and 22, it has shot up to 4.34% and 4.4% respectively, huge surge. Now, if I were to compare that gross NPA figure with something like HDFC Bank Limited, HDFC Bank still has a gross NPA of just 1.32%, right? So you can understand how painful it is right now for RBL. Let's go to the net NPA figure. 18-19 will first discuss. Net NPA was 0.78% and 0.69% and now it has gone to 2.12% to 
1.34 percent i know there's a little bit drop good but still 1.34 percent is higher if i'm comparing it with pre-pandemic right let's go on to the next one which is slippage ratio Achha, by the way slippage is something like how much fresh NPAs in the current year so that is like a slippage right so slippage which was around 0.31 percent and 0.41 percent had gone to 2.57 percent in 21 it has cooled off a little bit to 1.07 percent in March 22 right now three points I've talked about bad let me talk about one positive point also PCR which is the provision coverage ratio it has it is right now at 70.4 percent which is not that bad now with all this in uh, in your mind now what do you feel what can be can be the road ahead is it going to be really smooth now for that you have to understand currently be it India or be it any other country they are facing something known as the problem of inflation now with inflation the profitability is going to get hampered for those who have taken the loan and their repayment capacity can also get hampered right even if inflation comes under control the next big pain point which people can see is of recession now with all these things can i say the repayment capacity is what gets hampered answer is yes and if that gets hampered again problem is going to be faced by rbl not only rbl by any bank but for rbl it can be a little bit more pain point why because of the first point what unsecured or high risk lending so i hope Pain point number two is also absolutely clear. Well, the third pain point is that I believe company needs to find more good borrowers so that they can increase the secured lending. Now, why am I say, saying that? First, let's understand the logic behind it. What is happening with this bank right now is that their advances are increasing agreed, but their advances are in increasing at a pace which is lower than the increase in deposits. Guys, have a look at this chart. Now, if you see that if I'm comparing 2020 and 2021, their advances grew only by 1%, but their deposits grew by 26.5%. What is, what is the meaning of this? They are getting a lot of deposits, but they are not able to disburse that as a loan. Okay. Now, let's compare this with the 2021, uh, 2022 figure. At 2022, their advances grew to 60,022 crores with a growth of 2% but their deposits grew to 79,007 crores with a growth of 8%. Same old story is happening. They are getting more deposits but they are not able to disburse it to good borrowers. Now, what will this lead to? Will this lead to excess liquidity? Obviously, yes. And that is why if you see that their liquidity coverage ratio is 138% and if I compare them with the average of other banks, average of other banks is only 125 percent now with this what will happen will their profitability reduce yes will their roe drop yes will their roce drop yes and will their roa also drop answer is again yes now let's move on to the three key incidences which further added to the pain for this bank the very first one is that there were some allegations regarding insider trading so for that let's go to this article on et now wherein it is very clearly mentioned rbl ceo clarifies on insider trading charge says sebi did not contact them now what was this entire allegation about the allegation was that 27 employees of rbl uh, uh, 27 employees of rbl sold off their shares when on 30th now something had happened on 29th on 29th basically vijay siddhartha the ceo of coffee day enterprises went missing and i'm sure everyone knows what had happened in this unfortunate incidents well did this reflect in the share price yes this is a monthly candle but in july 29 the stock fell down by 36.76 percent and coffee day stock also went down by almost 46 percent now if i go on again on the same article of et now you can see that the very next question that pops up in the mind is that if the employees sold shares because of this unfortunate incidence in coffee day how much exposure did rbl have to coffee day uh, to coffee day right very clearly again management says that uh, till date in in past we have not given publicly about how much exposure we have to specific clients and he said this is what i would continue doing so i will not talk about the specific exposure then the next question which was again asked was that 
who sold off the shares were it people from the junior level middle level management or some senior level management he said he, he has clarified that no person who was in the key management position or such key individuals none of them have sold the shares it could be if junior or middle level employees have done so for their own reasons funding pressure other pressure whatever he is saying that they are perfectly entitled to do so even if they are selling their esops and he is saying that it is very well within the policy to do so right so that was about the first key pain point wherein you saw a big drop in the shares of the company the second key pain point was that mr vishwavir ahuja whom we have been talking about since the beginning of the video he was the one who actually shaped up this bank he went on immediate leave all of a sudden he went on leave now when people started to check what happened so this is december 26 2021 so when will the impact be seen that will be seen on december 27th right so if we go on to the daily chart of this uh, of this bank we can see that there is a big gap down let's just have a look at this big gap and this same day when mr ahuja went on a leave all of a sudden the bank share corrected by 18.48% that's a big drop and when i try to check out the reasons in the management commentary it is very unclear no convincing reason uh, why did this exactly happen so i think this was again a second key pain point for the bank moving on to the third key pain point was that rbi RBI appointed a director on the board of RBL now who was he he was mr r subramanya kumar and he originally has a major experience in public sector banking so again people were asking like he has uh, he has more core expert expertise and experience in the public sector bank how can he really add value for a private sector bank that was a pain that other people were saying and again one more important point is that RBI appointing a person as a director in some bank that is also not a very common scenario right so all these were the different key pain points which rbl had to go through i've talked about a lot of negative points let me tell also one positive point about the bank typically what happens the bank gets its books of account audited similarly rbi also audits the banks if they see that there is a lot of divergence they come up with a divergence report and in the rbi's divergence report about rbl there is no major divergence that's a positive point for the bank right the big question is that after this big fall of almost 90% from its peak am i going to buy answer is no not yet why number 1 i don't see any technical reversal in this as of now and number 2 if you remember i had also told that the management itself believes that they will take around 3 years for them to shift from this unsecured high risk category lending book to a comparatively secured one so i would want to wait for some signs of reversal and then i might reconsider my decision if you have loved this video don't forget to press that like button and please let me know in the comment section if you want me to do again a similar video on lic if you want you can surely let me know in the comment section i would be more than happy to do that video and don't forget to share this video with your friends if you want to know more about a recession proof stock don't forget to click here if you want to know more about a monsoon special stock you can click here till then take care jai hind and bye bye